Hi, Joe Reinhardt here, and I'm going to tackle the topic of Cisco ACI, specifically the logical constructs and containers that make up Cisco ACI. It can be a little confusing, so trying to wrap this around something familiar. So what are we going to talk about? First of all, how some people may see Cisco ACI, because it's a little confusing at times. How it compares to traditional networking. We'll use an analogy here of the Cisco Nexus 7000 virtual device context as sort of a jumping off place. Then we'll talk about the actual constructs, a little bit about the differences between a Nexus 7000 VDC and ACI because they're not identical, and then just kind of a wrap up. All right, so how do a lot of people Cisco ACI? I myself, when I started with ACI, found it very disorienting and somewhat confusing. It took me a while to kind of get my feet under me with regard to ACI. So lots of times, especially traditional network engineers, look at ACI and see a bunch of confusing information, things that seem to contradict the known laws of networking and things as they are. Basically, it's strange and somewhat contradictory to a lot of us. I know it was for me when I first got started. But really, ACI is an advanced, is advanced changes to the infrastructure. It's not just a new technology. It's a paradigm shift in a lot of ways. And so it represents the evolution of networking, specifically in the data center. And so since it's been around for five, six plus years, now it's, uh, it's here to stay. I've found that when you're trying to get used to a new technology, it kind of helps to compare to something you're already familiar with. And one of the ways that this will work is looking at Nexus 7000 VDCs and kind of picking apart the architecture and using that as a comparison point. So first of all, virtual device contexts. They've been around for a while. And it's a way of logically segmenting a Cisco Nexus 7000 switch, ASA firewalls had firewall instances before the 7K ever did. But they're logically separate switches. You take a Nexus switch and carve it up into four or eight, depending on whether it's a SOUP, SOUP2, or SOUP2E, and that doesn't include the administrative context. So you essentially can create all these virtual switches. Now, one of the things that's interesting is VDCs are completely and totally isolated from one another. In other words, if you create a virtual device context on a switch and you want it to connect to another virtual device context, there's no way in the back plane for them to connect. You have to literally interconnect ports on the front of the switch in order for them to communicate, which is something that was very different at the time it was introduced. VDCs are created manually. Kind of see here, you go into configuration mode. You do the VDC command, the VDC name, it'll then create that VDC up until however many are permitted by that particular chassis and or licensing scheme. Once that done, interfaces can be allocated to each VDC and those interfaces cannot be shared. They're dedicated to the VDC they're a part of. Depending on the generation of line card, there's even port assignment rules. Here's an example of VDC1 and VDC2, where there's ports 1 through 10 and 11 through 20 that are allocated, and then they become dedicated to that particular VDC using the two in this example. Once the VDC is operational, you can log into it and take care of all the configuration individually for that VDC. For example, VDC elements can include VRFs, VLANs, Interfaces, the interfaces you assign in previous steps, subnets, and routing protocols. You can have multiple routing protocols running in different VRFs, for example, and they'll completely separate from one another you do, unless you do some kind of route leaking. And what's interesting is you can duplicate everything except the VDC name inside of another VDC. They could be absolutely identical. And it, they'll never see each other. They don't interact. Obviously, if you interconnected them, you'd have to be more careful. But in each one, you could duplicate names because they're completely segregated from one another. So that's pretty much how the configuration and creation piece works. But how does it look logically? It looks more something like this. You have the individual VDCs. You have the VRFs that are contained, the VLANs, and so forth. You could maybe even simplify it and make it look sort of like this. Because the VRF is encompassing 
layer three, obviously, but also contains some other elements. So for example, you might create VLAN interfaces that then live in to some degree inside the VRF, especially if you assign it. And this is just one way it kind of look. Now that we've unpacked how VDCs basically operate, now we can kind of use that as a comparison point to the elements of Cisco ACI. So in this case, we're not talking about VDCs, but a tenant. Now, one of the things I want to point out is the names in ACI cannot have spaces in them. So it'll be tenant dash underscore or some other construct in order to be able to name them. The first element's called a tenant. It acts a lot like a VDC. If you think what VDCs do, they're independent of one another. You can assign resources to them. You can duplicate names. All that's true with tenants. If you think of a tenant as sort of analogous to a VDC, it really kind of helps clear up a lot of things. One of the things that's different, though, is a VDC lives on an individual Nexus switch, and an ACI, these tenants live across the entire collection of switches, which is called the ACI fabric. So tenants provide logical isolation. One tenant cannot communicate to another tenant without special configuration, just as VDCs can't communicate with, with one another without an interconnection. That analogy still plays out there. And like VDCs, you can have overlapping names, VLANs, IP addressing, all sorts of things because these are completely independent standalone elements. And obviously you can create multiple tenants. You're not limited to eight. You could do uh, hundreds and thousands of them depending on the hardware and software. Within a tenant is a VRF. Unlike VDCs, VRFs do not exist independently. You can create them one at a time in the Nexus 7000 and they're sort of standalone items that you associate with interfaces and such. But in ACI, a VRF lives inside a tenant and it does the same thing a VRF does. There's really no difference whatsoever. One of the things that's different, however, is the tenant name gets joined to the VRF name. So, for example, if it's VRF underscore 100, the name of the VRF, as far as ACI is concerned, is tenant 100 colon VRF 100. So, you have a tenant. Inside the tenant are VRFs. We're used to a default VRF already being existence on a VDC. In ACI, you have to create it. Inside the VRF, so you can kind of think of this as sort of like the Russian nested dolls, one inside another. So, you have the tenant the outer shell, the VRF inside that, and inside of that is one or more what are called bridge domains. A bridge domain is a layer two broadcast domain and functions a lot like a VLAN. Strictly speaking, it's not a VLAN. It's technically a VXLAN segment, but it does a lot of the things that we're used to with VLANs. If you take a look at my other presentation on VXLAN and network overlays, some of this will probably make more sense, but it's a layer two VXLAN segment. Bridge domains hold one or more subnets, just like when you go into a VLAN interface, you give it an IP address. ACI creates an SVI interface that serves as the default gateway for that particular IP address range inside that tenant. Well, inside that bridge domain, inside that VRF, inside that tenant, and so forth. But it serves as the default gateway. You can configure multiple subnets per bridge domain, but only one can be primary, and this is no different than NXOS and iOS, where all your additional addresses would have the secondary keyword. And one of the things that's interesting is Cisco ACI creates a distributed AnyCast gateway across all the leaf switches using that address. So when there's an endpoint that attaches to that switch, that becomes its default gateway. 